a world where much of the existing wildlife is threatened or diminishing, there are still some species that not only survive, but thrive. The gulls are one example. As seabirds, gulls have always been able to exploit the natural resources of the sea. But during the last 150 years, many species have undergone a change of lifestyle while being attracted to the land as an abundant source of food. The result? A series of population explosions for gulls. This unnatural situation is directly related to the living pattern of humans and has created many problems. Directly involved in this dilemma is a common New Zealand species. Gulls play an important part in the affairs of humans. Firstly, as a symbol, they are associated for most people with the sea, hence the name seagull, which seems to apply to all types of gulls. Secondly, as a problem, or a series of problems, mostly related to human methods of waste disposal. Apart from being a symbol or a problem, the 44 species of gulls are among the most successful of all the birds of the world. All are to some extent scavengers, a natural habit which has drawn them to centers of human population. An abundance of food waste has caused many gull species to become largely dependent on the effluent of human affluence. As a result, their numbers continue to increase. In the case of the Northern Hemisphere herring gull, its population has actually doubled in only six years. In New Zealand, gulls already outnumber the three million people by about two to one. The commonest gull down under is the southern black-backed gull. It's found in New Zealand, along the coastlines of South Africa and South America, and also in a few fringe colonies in Australia. To the Maori people of early New Zealand, the black-backed gull was known as Kororo. The other two endemic gulls are smaller and quite different in appearance and character. The red-billed gull is very much a coastal seabird and more qualified to be called a seagull. The black-billed gull is more of a freshwater bird which is mainly found away from the sea coast, on riverbeds and newly ploughed farmland. It could be called the inland gull, for it's common on almost every inland lake. Like many of its gull relatives throughout the world, Karoro has experienced a gradual change of lifestyle, directly related to the living pattern of humans. In spite of this change, most instinctive behaviour has been retained. Feeding in the smooth lee of giant kelp is one example. In this case, on small crustaceans, mollusks and sea snails. With a breeding life of about 12 years and a life expectancy of almost 25 years, the devoted pairs spend most of their time together. Their differences, which are mainly in appearance, are not always obvious. The male's head is flatter 
and slightly larger than the smaller, more rounded head of the female. Locating and retrieving natural food takes skill and patience. At low tide, the versatile birds use a shallow, submerged dive to bring up starfish from the sandy bottom. This plunge dive is not easy for such a large, buoyant creature. The starfish is carefully rinsed free of sand before it's swallowed. This anxious female is keen to pick up another, but must wait until the first is clear of her throat. The male is still searching. Another starfish is spotted. But the attempt fails. Low tide also provides a bonus meal in the form of shellfish. Another ancient practice is the dropping of shellfish on hard sand or rock. Once again, determination is needed, as it often takes many attempts to break open the shell. This natural feeding routine has been modified. Wherever there is a roadway close by, braking becomes easier. Then there's also the chance that a passing vehicle may assist. Scavenging is an instinctive part of gull behavior. These patrollers of the tide line are quick to devour anything dead that is washed up on the beach. In the course of their duty, the birds perform an indispensable public service for which there is little recognition. Another natural feeding habit that's been modified is scavenging at sea. A fishing boat discharging offal always has its flock of gulls in attendance. They follow in much the same way as their ancestors followed the return of a Maori canoe from the fishing grounds. And there must have been gulls overhead when the legendary figure of Maui fished up the North Island from the sea. As strong flyers, gulls have always been known to follow shipping far out to sea. New Zealand's inter-island ferries also have their attachment of gulls, which mainly feed on food scraps from the ship's cafeteria. These birds have adjusted their feeding routine to benefit from the scheduled eating habits of ferry passengers. Attention, please. Passengers are advised that the cafeteria is now open for meals and light refreshments. It's all very organized as meals come on time in almost any weather. Except in very rough conditions when all eating is disrupted. Kororo, the adaptable seagull, has gradually become a land gull, for it now gets more food from the land than the sea. 
One of the main distribution centres is the regional rubbish tip. It is here at this somewhat traditional institution that the reality of our wasteful ways becomes hard to ignore. There is, literally speaking, bags of food here, just for the taking. The perceptive birds patiently wait for the tractor to break open the paper sacks. With abundant supplies available 24 hours a day, the gulls are thriving. As well as regular deliveries of edible household rubbish, each tip provides a selection of luxury foods. Now this one, near Nelson City, has export quality fish offal, direct from the local fisheries. The obvious effect of this pattern of high living is an enormous increase in the number of gulls. One place where such a scene becomes a bewildering spectacle is the outflow of a meat processing works. Freezing companies are required to control the content of effluent discharge into harbors and rivers, but here at Ocean Beach, it all goes into the sea. In this case, the birds are not only living off the fat of the lamb, but also a sizable portion of the meat. There is, of course, the risk that such mobile birds can transmit harmful bacteria and disease. This does occur but is minimized by their natural instinct to wash and preen in a very thorough fashion. A freshwater stream provides an ideal spot for bathing and drinking. Although they prefer to drink fresh water, gulls are specially equipped to drink seawater. At sea, their salt extraction system provides them with adequate water. The nasal glands act as a sort of biological condenser, while the unwanted salt in concentrated solution is extruded through the nostrils. The inefficient disposal of raw sewage is the most disturbing factor in relation to the feeding habits of gulls. There is more to this peaceful aquatic scene than meets the eye. Firstly, there is the smell. These gulls are attracted to one of New Zealand's many coastal sewage outflows, which continually pour effluence into the sea. With fishing grounds and a city bathing beach nearby, this unhealthy attraction is also a health hazard for humans. In this case, there is an international airport close by, where birds often conflict with aircraft movements. Both aircraft and birds have their own established flight paths, but for different reasons. For the unscheduled gulls, it's simply the most direct route from roosting area to feeding ground. But for the scheduled flights of humans, it's the critical area of takeoff and landing.
The risk of gold striking aircraft is a continuing problem for pilots and airport authorities, but one which could be reduced if rubbish tips were located well away from airports and sewage treated accordingly. Corodo has also become a rural gull and is often found with the smaller black-billed gull. Most people working on the land accept all types of gulls as efficient exterminators of grubs and other insect pests. But during the spring lambing season, Corodo's scavenging habits become more predatory. This corresponds with the off-season, when meat works are closed, and therefore makes it difficult for the gulls to maintain their meaty diet. As a result, they sometimes attack newborn lambs, or scavenge dead ones, and may even peck the eyes from cast sheep, if given the chance. To discourage this, some farmers exercise their right to shoot offending birds. The search for food can also take Corolo high into the mountains, to altitudes of up to 2,000 meters. By the end of winter, most pairs have taken up territory for the nesting season. Wherever there is a regular food supply, the enterprising birds establish a colony. On farming country in Southland, a peat bog proves to be an ideal site. This one is only five minutes flying time from the local meat works. The killing season for export meat corresponds with the chick stage of the nesting cycle, so the birds are naturally looking forward to the opening of the meat works. They have become so dependent on this supply that a disruption could jeopardize the survival of their chicks. Nesting colonies are socially well organized. Each pair has a set territory with boundaries which are invisible to humans, but clearly defined by the birds, which are constantly on guard. For communication, gulls use a form of sign language, or signals. As well as audible sounds, different postures are used to convey the message. The trumpeting call means keep away. This is occupied territory. If a warning call is ignored, skirmishes result. At this stage, there is a lot of pre-nesting behavior going on, like grass pulling, which is a prelude to nest building. Simulated regurgitation is one of the many mutual displays which strengthen the pair bond. It occurs only on home territory and reinforces their claim. The nest is well built and hollowed to take up to three eggs. Incubation is shared by both birds and takes about 25 days. There is usually at least one of the pair on guard at the nest. If the eggs are unattended, they will be quickly devoured by other gulls. Despite quarrelsome neighbors, Gulls seem to enjoy life in the colony with its collective security. But for these colonist gulls on an island in Wellington Harbour, it is more a case of maximum security, for the island is an agricultural quarantine station.
Back on the peat bog, the first eggs are beginning to hatch. A star-like crack indicates that the chick in this egg has started to use its egg tooth to break out of the shell. Hatching takes a lot of effort and body work. After each push, the chick rests for up to 10 seconds before resuming the struggle. Within a matter of hours, it soon dries out to become a fluffy young Cororo. Parent birds regurgitate while feeding and nothing is wasted. A red spot at the bill tip helps the chick locate food. The first few days of life are the most dangerous, as neighbours may attack and kill unguarded chicks. To make matters worse, they soon begin to roam. At this stage, their natural camouflage helps them to survive, but by the time they are ten days old, their size makes them easy to spot. Ten weeks after hatching, the newly feathered youngsters are able to swim. On coastal colonies, where there is no grass cover, they take to the water for protection, but often at some risk in rough seas. Some are hesitant about taking the plunge, while others are not yet ready for their first swim. At seven weeks, the young are more independent and able to fly. Still retaining the pathetic wheezing call, they beg to be fed. If parent birds are reluctant to cooperate, other adults are tried. Still in the moat, adult birds help to loosen old feathers by bathing, and it's quite a performance.
gaps created by missing wing feathers reduce their flying ability and also affect takeoff power and judgment. This means a higher casualty rate for birds avoiding road traffic during the molt. It takes up to four years for the young to reach breeding maturity, and at all stages they look different from adults. At the end of the first year they molt to produce a mottled plumage in the second year. During the third year, the black wings and white body show through as they begin to attain the mature look. The flight of Caroro is efficient, versatile and beautiful in all its forms. In countries where excessive gull numbers create high levels of predation on the young of other bird life, control programs are used. In New Zealand, predation by gulls takes only a small portion of the young of other species, but the most seriously affected by any further increase in gulls would be the terns. The delicate terns are associated with gulls during nesting, when their eggs and chicks become easy prey for the gulls. Turn populations throughout the world are diminishing, and predation by gulls is one of the main causes. It's therefore essential to maintain a natural balance between gulls and terns if terns are to survive in New Zealand. It will take many years for the results of any corrective measures to become apparent but if the present growth rate of gulls continues, it will indicate human failure to rectify this problem. It will also endorse failure to help this once noble creature regain its status in the natural world as a seabird to be admired and respected. <laughs>